Good evening, good evening, good evening, my beautiful Baldy sisters. So good to be here tonight. I am so excited about being uh, the spokesperson for us on tonight. My name is Deanna Morris. I am a life coach. I am a pastor. I am a empowerment speaker. I am a woman. I'm a baldy, and I'm excited about that. I'm also a wife, and I am just your regular homegirl and your sister. And so on tonight, it is an absolute honor and privilege to be here to share with you uh, my journey of, uh, they asked me to come up with a name, and I call this Finally Naked and Unashamed. I am so excited to be able to say that, that I am finally naked and unashamed. And when I say naked, I mean, I'm not hiding anything. What you see is simply what you get. Uh, no hair and all. I am beautiful. I am all that I was created in the earth to be from the very beginning. So I'm excited about that. So on tonight, I am so excited about sharing my story. I'm so thankful that I have the opportunity. I know some of you will come in and listen to the replay, but I hope that something is said that will inspire you, that will impact you, that will give you the courage that you need to move forward, not only move forward, but to become impactful in somebody else's life. So let me just kind of get back, go into my story and share a little bit about me. Again, my name is Deanna Morris and I live in Richmond, Virginia. Well, they gave me a series of questions, so I'm going to just dive into the question. One of the questions that I was asked was, when did you become a baldy? Here's the thing. I became a baldy in 1988. I have been uh, bald since 1988, which is 31 years now. The crazy thing is I was covered as a baldy for 28 of those years. So I have only been uh, naked and unashamed for a little less than three years. So here's a little bit about my story. Um, in 1988, I uh, was diagnosed with leukemia and I was told six months later that I had to have a bone marrow transplant in order to survive. So in 88, um, at that time, it was fairly new when they began doing bone marrow transplants. So I lived in Atlanta, Georgia at the time, but they um, were doing the most successful bone marrow transplants in Seattle, Washington. So my mother, I was 12, started doing the research and we wind up going to Seattle for a year for me to get treatment. But before we left Atlanta, I got um, two rounds of chemo. And in getting the chemo, um, they never told me that I was going to lose my hair. I didn't know. All I knew was that I had cancer and that um, I had to go through treatment. So if they told me about the hair, I really don't remember. I think I was so traumatized about the idea of having cancer that I didn't, um, I don't remember even knowing anything about the hair. I just know that one morning I woke up in the hospital. I had been in the hospital for about a month going through the first round of chemo. And um, I woke up that morning and I put my hand in my head, laying on the pillow. And when I brought my hand back, all of this hair, glumps of hair were in my head. And I'm like, oh my God, what is this? 12 years old. I mean, this is the stage that I'm just hitting puberty. I'm just really getting, you know, nowadays little girls are in their hair early. Well, during that time, I wasn't even getting in the groove of curling hair or combing hair. I'm 12 years old. I'm just hitting that stage where you get ready to go into all of the girly, girly uh, concepts of, of being a preteen. So when my hair came out of my head, I immediately panic. I'm crying. I'm hysterical. I'm on the phone at the house because I'm there by myself. I called my mom. I said, I am not coming out of this room, not, let alone leave the hospital. I'm not coming out of the room into the hospital hallway without, without some hair. You have to go and find me a wig and the wig has to match my hair. 12 years old, giving demands. Come on. So, um, at that time I had just, um, gotten a jerry curl cause I was sick for a little while before they diagnosed me. So my hair had already begun to come out, but it was growing back. I had got a jerry curl. Yeah, that's right. I got a jerry curl. So when I got the jerry curl, um, uh, when my hair came out, it came out, I had the curl and it came out. 
So my thing with my mom was you find a wig that is identical to my hair and you bring it and I'm not coming out. So I think that was maybe like 10 o'clock in the morning. So my mom didn't get there until six o'clock in the afternoon. This is 31 years ago, you guys. And this is how real and vivid this is to me. So I think it was about six o'clock in the afternoon when she got there and she came in with this wig. And strangely enough, before I uh, sat down to do this live, I actually went and found the picture of me in that first wig. So let me show you guys that. This is the picture of my very first wig. It This picture is probably three months after my hair came out. And um, that's the very first wig that I ever had. And I, nobody could have ever told me back then that that wig at age 12, I would still be wearing wigs 28 years later. That's right. I said 28 years later. I wore wigs for 28 years. I was absolutely afraid and scared of what people were going to think. And they knew I had been sick. They knew all of those things. But for 28 years, I just could not bring myself to that most vulnerable place of exposing my secret. I mean, some of them actually knew, but it was still my personal secret. It belonged to me and it was something that I wanted to keep hidden. So um, when I became um, a baldy, I, I, this is the one thing that I remember about it. When I first went home, I would only take my hair off around my immediate family which was my brothers and my mom and my dad. And I remember being home one day, sitting up under the piano. We had a piano in our home and I was sitting up under the piano crying. And I remember my brother coming in the room and getting under the piano with me. And he said, what is wrong? And I said, I'm, I've lost my hair. I don't look like a girl anymore. And he said, well, it's okay. I'll shave my head too. So he did. I was 12 and I think he was about 10 and he shaved his head so we could match and he went through that process with me so um going forward and i'll backtrack back and forth in this uh, story in 2017 just on a whim really on a whim i decided that i was not going to wear wigs anymore and when I say I wore wigs, I had every style. I dyed the wigs. I cut the wigs. I put the wigs in the dryer to make them fluffy. I wore them sideways so it'll give me a high right, low left. I did everything that you could think of doing to a wig. I did it. And so um, in 2017, I just kind of was sitting on the couch one night and it was like, okay, what are you going to do? And I always kept my hair either shaved because there were times that I tried to get it to grow and it wouldn't grow. There were times that um, it would grow, but it would only grow in patches. And and I didn't understand why. And I later found out the reason that the hair would not grow is because with me going through the chemotherapy, the one thing that I did know once my hair came out that most of the kids that were around me, when their hair came back in, it was a really good grade of hair. Well, for me, I didn't have that experience. My hair never um, got the opportunity to come back in because six months after my second round of chemo, I went to have a bone marrow transplant. And in having a bone marrow transplant, one of the things that they had to do at that time, there's new technology now, they had to give you chemo in a shot. I got chemo intravenously. I got chemo in pills. So I got a lot of chemotherapy. And in that, it did a lot of damage to my skin. My skin changed colors. Uh, it closed the hair particles. So my pores and my head were closed. So my hair never grew back. And But they kept telling me it was going to grow and it never did. And so, um, or it would grow in patches and in spots, but it wasn't full enough for me to um, walk around with a head full of hair. And so I kind of got used to it. And at that age of 12, when this process started, the crazy thing is that was the time as a little girl, we are our most girly girly going into that stage of becoming a teenager. And how many of you really understand that this is the time that you recognize who you are as a woman, you're coming into your own and how devastating and and I don't even know the words. I still think about it sometimes. I cannot put in words that feeling of my girlfriends getting their hair done. They're going to the 
shop and they're doing all this stuff. And here I am on the sidelines looking in. I remember uh, for many years, not even going to a hairdresser. I would not go into the hair salon. Even my mom was getting her hair done or somebody I was with, I would wait outside. I would wait in the car because I always felt like everybody knew it was a wig. So imagine, now mind you, I'm telling you this 28 years of this, but anyway, in 2017, I just was sitting on the couch one night and just decided that I was going to, um, just decided I was going to start just carrying my hair clean shave, but I was going to keep wearing my wigs. But that night when I shaved my head and I went to, it was just like specks of hair that I would always have to shave off. I went to the mirror and I looked in the mirror and I said, Hmm, that's not bad. You don't look so bad. Well, let me try to put some makeup on with this. So I put my, because I always love my makeup. So when I put my makeup on, it still looked like, okay, this is not bad. And I remember asking my husband, so what do you think about this? He was like, it's fine. I said, so what if I told you that I was going to start winning? He's like, I don't care. Whatever you want to do, you know, I got you. And that night in January of 2017, I um, decided to take my wig off. And I just didn't decide to do it in private my initial removal and becoming naked and unashamed, I took my wig off and I posted pictures on Facebook because I knew if I posted them on Facebook, I could not come back off of it. It's out there now. It's exposed. Where better to expose it than to the whole Facebook world? And that's what I did. And it was so empowering. It was so impactful, inspiring. It went viral. And the people that I've known all my life, that some knew and some didn't know. They sent me the most encouraging messages. And, you know, it just, it opened up a whole new world of confidence for me. So, which will take me back into some other aspects of my story. So, um, I, I shared about uh, how long um, I had been hiding, because that's what, that's the word that I choose to, how I choose to describe my experience. I hid for 30, for like 28 years, I hid out of fear. I hid out of inadequacy. I hid because I was afraid of what other people thought. And here's the crazy part about that. In hiding, I was inspiring other women to be all that they wanted to be. I was a, a life coach. I was a motivational speaker for women. I was a pastor. I had a women's ministry. And I'm telling these women that you can be anything and don't hide and be unashamed and be naked and be you and nobody can stop you from being you. And guess what I was doing while I was standing in front of these women? I was wearing a mask the whole entire time. I am telling them that they are great. They are awesome. They are wonderful while I'm behind a mask. That's like me on this on this uh, live talking to you and telling you, take your mask off, take your mask off. And you're looking at me the whole time like, don't you have on a mask? That's exactly what I did for a lot of years. And I would come home and have these experiences of uh, fear that, not so much fear that somebody would know. I knew they knew by that time that there were wigs, but it was the vulnerability of how would you feel, what would you think of me and how would you feel about me if you saw the real me, the naked me, not, you know, the me from behind the makeup, the me without the wig. What would you think? What would you say? Am I still able to encourage you? Am I still uh, impactful? Because in, in my eyes, it was like I was lacking something as a woman. And that was because of all the images that I saw on TV was long hair and curly hair. And you do this with your hair. You know, those commercials where you're riding down the street and you ride it in a convertible and the hair is blowing and, you know, or, or you got your little bonnet on trying to keep your hair in place. Well, I didn't have those experiences. When I rode in a convertible, and I can give you a true story, when I rode in a convertible, I was holding my head. I didn't even enjoy the ride because I was riding like this the whole time, pretending or laying in my head, pretending like I was just trying to be comfortable. Really, I was just trying to hold my wig in place. That's the truth. So, um, that was that was um, just so many different parts of my journey. And like I said, it's, it, it has been 31 years. So there are so many places that I've been. I think the most common thing that I experienced was always feeling like I had a secret, always feeling like there was a part of me that nobody knew about but those people that were the closest to me because I felt like they would not judge me. They would always accept me for who I was, but I was always encouraged to just be me, just go out there and do it. 
And I remember when I did remove um, my wig in 2017, because I not only, I only wore wigs. I didn't wear wraps. I didn't feel comfortable with that. It was wigs. And I'm telling you, I had all kinds of wigs. I, when I cleaned my house out after I came, after I um, took the wigs away, I had so many wigs to throw away that I just had been holding on to. But it was such, it was an experience that I appreciate now because I can genuinely recognize when people are hiding. Regardless, and we all hide behind something. So my journey, I've learned that I don't uh, rest in tragedy. I take my tragedy and make it a destiny. And that's something that I truly encourage each of us. I don't care what your situation is, what your circumstance is. Take your tragedy and make it a destiny. There is something great that can come out of anything that you go through. I don't care what it is. There's something great that can come out of it. And so um, it asked me... <laughs> What has been your most memorable moment as a Baldy? And when I share this story, it is all true. I um I am a preacher and a pastor. My husband and I pastor a church. And some years ago, um, I was a part of a ministry, and I was one of the per the people that were uh, that was always in front of the congregation talking and sharing. So one service, it was a really awesome service, and I'm up ministering to the people, talking and walking and going back and forth across the pulpit. And I remember saying these words, and this is how impactful this is. I remember saying out loud to the people, somebody's going to get over their insecurity today. Somebody's going to get over the fact that they are worried about what people think about them. Imagine me saying those words while hiding behind a wig. And I'm saying this and I'm just so excited. And I said, somebody's going to, it's going to happen for somebody today. And I threw my head back and guess what? My wig came off in front of the whole entire congregation. And the wig was laying on the floor. Here's the part. This is the most memorable part of this. And I hope that this will help somebody get free of what other people think. So I had just said these most powerful words to everybody in the congregation. Somebody's going to get over their insecurity. Somebody's going to get over their um, their uh, 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 thoughts of what people think about them. Threw my head back and my wig fall off in the front of the congregation. And guess what I did? I didn't panic. I didn't fall out. I didn't kick. I kept on ministry. I kept on ministering to the people, not even realizing that I was speaking a word to myself that, hey girl, you just got over your stuff because you still operating in what you're supposed to operate in. And losing that wig didn't even affect you. You're still doing it. Guess what happened? I was still ministering, still going. And the people that were around me, that were trying to protect me and be there for me, where they grabbed the wig, I'm still moving, and they started going around me trying to get to me to put the wig back on my head. I'm still trying to encourage the people, and guess what happened? I stood still so they can put my insecurity back on me. They didn't mean any harm. They didn't uh, even recognize. But think about what I just said. Somebody's going to get over their insecurity. Somebody's going to get over those feelings of, of needing validation. And that was for me. Because in that instance, the very thing that I talked about happened to me. But And I kept moving in it. But those that were around me that were there to help and to hold me up and to support me didn't realize that I was the one that I was talking to. So what I allowed them to do was put the insecurity and the vulnerable and the that place of secrecy and shame and nakedness back on top of me. Isn't that something to just really think about? In that moment, I had to stop and park right there. So many of us in our life, especially in this baldy experience, allow other people to dictate what is normal. We allow other people to tell us what looks good and what doesn't look good. We allow television to tell us. We allow um, those in our circle. I had some girlfriends that said, girl, don't you do that. Don't you take that wig off. I I'll protect you, but don't you do it. I don't need protecting from other people. As long as I have the support of those around me, as long as you have people supporting you, as long as you have people che cheering you on, and even when you don't, as long as you can pat yourself on the back and move forward, you can experience, you can have an awesome baldy experience. 
as long as you know who you are. So that's my most memorable moment. And it was when I got free without knowing I was being free. And then I turned around and let somebody um, cover me up and hide me again in the open. So um, one of my other questions, which I love this question because it allows me a little bit of opportunity to talk about my wonderful husband. It says, do you think, no, how does your husband, how does your husband react to your baldness? So I've read some of my sister's amazing stories. I love the stories about the ex-husbands, especially, I can't remember who it was, but she told a story about, he said, nobody wants a bald woman. Let me tell you. So I was married prior and my husband, my ex-husband told me that everything was well. He had saw my head and he was okay with it. And I found out five years into the marriage that he had a problem with it, which really, really, really tore me down because you know, if I, if I couldn't be vulnerable with anybody else, I thought I would be vulnerable with the person that I was going to spend the rest of my life with. And so in spite of that, um, the marriage did not last. So being married again was going to be trying. I didn't, I didn't know what to expect because when somebody tells you that they're with you and then you find out halfway into a committed relationship in the relationship five years in that they really are not happy about what they told you they were happy about, especially something like that. That's so personal. This is my vulnerability and I've shared it with you and you told me it was okay. And I found out what you said to me was a lie. So when I met my, um, my current husband, my king, my, he is my everything. When I met my husband, um, he had long locks and I was still wearing my wigs. And um, our story is so unique because we only dated for a month and two days and we got married. I don't recommend that to a lot of people, but that's just our story. So um, I remember one night we had probably been dating maybe two weeks. We were sitting around watching movies and I was laying on his shoulder, laying somewhere near him. And he said to me, share something with me. I'm in love, y'all. I'm like, sure, anything, whatever. You know, we're going to spend the rest of our life together. Absolutely. And he says, share something with me. And I'm like, okay. And he touched my wig. Oh, my God. The end of this relationship. No, sir. Uh-uh. Our love has gone out the window. I don't want to do this. This is not. Uh -uh. And when he touched my wig, I'm like, uh-uh. I said, nope. And he said, no, it's okay. So I said reluctantly, I said, it's okay. That's fine. Okay, okay. And I began to close my eyes. And I guess he could feel the fear in me to the point that, I mean, it felt like I just went into being a little girl again. And all of a sudden he said, never mind. It's okay. If you're not ready, it's okay. And I thought that was the greatest thing in the world for him to say, if you're not ready, it's okay. And I'm just like, man, that is so wonderful to have somebody that's so patient. Well, you have to know my husband. So um, we keep watching the movie and about 30 minutes into the movie. Now, somebody, I'm not going to lie. Some of my beautiful baldy sisters would have been fighting after this moment. I was laying next to him still. And all of a sudden, I feel my wig come off. And all I see is it flying across the room. We're right here and my wig is over there. I have two options. I have to get up and go get it, which means I got to look at you, look at me and pretend like it's all right based on my prior experience. Or I have to honor the fact that you say it's all right after I get over the fact that you snatched my wig off. So um, I remember burying my face into his lap crying, just burying my face into his lap because I was so afraid of what his reaction was was going to be and him rubbing me and saying, it's okay. It's okay. Just let me see. Let me see. Let me see. And I remember being so afraid to turn around and face him. I was terrified because of my prior experience. And I remember when I turned around to face him, he was just looking at me and he was like, nothing in his face changed, nothing in his mood changed. He was like, it's okay. Everything is okay. I promise you, it's okay. And he said, go get a brush. Let me brush your hair. I'm like, go get a brush. The hardest part was looking him in his face to determine, is what you're saying to me really okay? Is what you're really saying okay? And I remember he said, go get a hairbrush. Let me brush your hair. 
And from that moment on, he began to try to grow my hair back and treat my hair. And because of what I had experienced with the pores, it just wouldn't grow. And I was okay with that. It would grow a little bit and he was okay with it. And But guess what? I still put that wig right on back on. I did. I was still hiding, still ashamed, still afraid, even though the person that I'm supposed to spend the rest of my life with is telling me that it's okay. It wasn't okay with me. But guess what? I was still encouraging other women that they could be anybody, that they could do anything, and that you are the greatest, and you are fearfully and wonderfully made, and still hiding at the same time. And there are a lot of us that uh, walk through this baldy experience, some that are listening even now and will listen later, you are still hiding because you haven't gotten to a comfortable place. And I want to encourage you tonight, get to a comfortable place where you love you and you accept you. And it may not come overnight. It may take a minute to, um, to get there. You may start off with family. I had family members that have known me, um, all of my life, 40 years that had never seen my house, my head when they came in, I covered up. Even if it was a t-shirt, anything that was around, I covered my head up. I'll lay still so they couldn't see me. And when I um, did make the decision to, um, to come out, I just wanted to be free. I was tired of hiding. And there was so, there was always this feeling that I had something that I was hiding from, that there was always a piece of me that I couldn't share. And so it was like, I was almost a fraud. I was telling everybody else that they could do these wonderful things, but I didn't believe enough in myself that I could. And so, um, I am at this place now that I am truly naked and unashamed. And even in encountering this group, it has been an absolute joy and thrill. I still have moments where I feel like the ugly duckling. I think we all have that. And I don't think that's just anything with us that are uh, baldies. I think it's just something that women sometimes go through. But God, you guys are giving me so much life, so much strength. There are so many things that I have wanted to do um, that I didn't feel comfortable doing because not only do I have issues with my hair, but I have scars and different things. And one of the things that I posted in a group, I think it was a few months ago, there were pictures that I wanted to do. Uh, like I see people do these pictures of from their breast up and exposing their body. And I'm like, I got too many scars and people don't think that looks crazy. But because of some of you and seeing you post so many wonderful, encouraging words, I did it and I shared it with you guys first. I shared it with y'all before I shared it even with my family and they loved it. It, it. This group has brought such another part of my life out that I just did not know existed. And I'm so grateful for it. I, I've done this, uh, walked this experience, like I said, for 31 years. And if I had had this safe haven Years ago, I think I would be farther along. I'm grateful for where I am now in my business and my life. But there are sometimes you have to find somebody that's just like you that can understand it. And even if they don't understand it, you can share the experience together so that you'll be able to grow. And you guys have provided me such an opportunity to grow. And that's one of the reasons that I wanted to do uh, Baldy Talk Tuesday because you guys are impacting me. So I wanted to be able to give something back. My journey, um, if I could describe it in one word, I would call it hidden. I was hidden. My real beauty, my real, uh, who I really was, was hidden for so long because I was so afraid of what other people were going to think of me. Now I am just like that person that just I want you to know, I, my, the biggest part of my business now, when I go places and my husband said, you wearing a hat? No, I am not. I want them to remember the bald lady that came in. And sometimes it's so funny when I go places and I see another baldy sister in the place, I feel some kind of way like, God, I want to be the one to leave the impression, but I got another sister here. So let's just share the spotlight together. Because one thing that I know is this is who Deanna is. And the greatest part of being me now is that I don't have any secrets. I don't have anything to hide. What you see is what you get. I'm not hiding behind wigs. I'm not hiding behind makeup. I have too much that has happened 
in my life to hide who I truly am. My baldness is a part of my story. It's a part of my testimony. It's a part of my life. My scars are a part of my life. I have had, um, just a quick recap. I've had leukemia. I've had a bone marrow transplant. I've had a cornea transplant. Uh, last year in October, I had open heart surgery. I had a triple bypass surgery. I've had three heart attacks. I've been blind. I've been deaf. I've been to the place that I couldn't walk. I've been to the place that I could not um, take care of myself, but I'm still here sharing a story. And whatever, and whatever, Every part of my life, be it tragic, be it drama, be it uh, trauma, I am going to make it a destiny. I'm going to make it so impactful that I'm going to leave a legacy that somebody else can survive based on what I've been through. I don't want to just inspire people. I want to be impactful because when you inspire someone, it leaves us. Sometimes it's temporary, but when you impact them, it leaves a lasting impression that will create change immediately. So I am so excited about that. I'm so grateful to be here to share with you guys. I wanted to just kind of share some information about uh, my business. I am, here's a little, I don't know if you guys can see that, but I'll give it to you. My business is Life Seeds Coaching and Developing Firm. It is a coaching, uh, life coaching business. I am certified as a life coach. I'm certified as a relationship coach for seasoned relationships as well as new and beginning relationships. I help prepare you for the journey of marriage. I am an empowerment speaker. I am also a prayer coach because part of my my walk is that I am a pastor, I am a minister, and I just believe that I have truly come this far by faith. Uh, also, I have a couple of books out. My Husband's Rib is one of my books, and it has a story in there about my experience with my husband when he found out that I was bald and how the whole situation went down. I kind of gave you a little snippet of it, but the book will give you information about that. My website is uh, www.lifeseeds cdf.com and you can get information about my books you can get information about booking me as a speaker you can get information about life coaching i'm telling you guys i am so excited about this group and the lives that is touching it is touching women across the world and i'm excited to be a part of it i hope that something that i've said something that i shared has truly inspired you um, if I can do anything to be of encouragement, if I can do anything to be of assistance, we are truly sisters in this thing. We are baldy sisters. I'm telling you, I love that. I go everywhere and I say, they say, um, oh, you're, you're, my husband used to say, my wife is the bald headed lady. I'm not the bald headed lady. I'm not bald headed. I'm bald. Just call me bald. That works for me. And so when I found the name, saw the name of the group, the Baldy Movement, I was like, oh, I'm in, I am in love with that. So I am so thankful tonight. Thank you guys for your time. Those that will come back and watch the replay, have a phenomenal evening. Enjoy. Enjoy the rest of your night. Now get this. If you're going to be a Baldy, rock this thing. Don't hold out. Don't let somebody encourage you and trick you. It will convince you not to do it. If you're going to do it, do it. Just dive in and do it. You have a whole network of sisters that are supporting you. If you have a bad day, get in a group. Somebody has a story to tell that'll make you laugh. So you guys have a great one. This is Coach Deanna Morris. I love you guys. Be encouraged. We're in this thing together. Have a great evening.